to the to in Jesus' name. It's a healing experience. And I pray it's the same for each one of us. When I look back this week that has just gone by, it was a mixed week. Mixed packages of things you could hear. Sometimes created an impression in the heart and I posed some very important questions to me personally. I'm not sure about you. Have you looked at some of the things that have happened? You've heard the news of the death of Susan's mom. A very, very sad news. And I remembered when my father-in-law died and how it had shook us and touched us. I'm sure each one of us have lifted Susan's family in your personal prayers. We also heard the news of the German wings, the flight which crashed with the French Alps, killing 150 people on board. I think about 16 of them were children from the school, on a school trip with teachers. And there were citizens from different countries and nationalities, all of them dead. It got me thinking how uncertain our life is. Our probation could close any time. For those people on the board, that was it. Their probation had closed. They could not go back and do anything different. They didn't have a chance. Of one depressed co pilot who crashed the flight. So today's message that I have to inspire by the Spirit to share is a message when I contemplated on, when I came across various articles and uh, collected information from around, I thought I would love to share this particular message on the John the Baptist generation. And who is this generation? Do we fit into this generation, you and me? I would invite the congregation to pray before I move ahead with this message. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 7 
says the son of man I have made you watchmen for the house of Israel who oh, hear the word I speak and give them warning from me this middle-aged Baptist farmer and his Bible student called William Miller for 13 long years in Lowhampton in New York farmhouse had crunched the numbers of the prophecy backwards and forwards to assure the logic of integrity and study and every time his calculation circled back to the same conclusion Christ would return in the middle 1840s should he sound warning but how could he do? he was just a simple farmer Great controversy, page 330 writes, When I was about my business, he said, that's William Miller, it was continually ringing in my ears. Go and tell the world that danger. This text was constantly occurring to me. And the text goes on to say, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. And if thou dost not speak, to warn the wicked from his way, that the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require to die at thy hand. <coughs> Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his ways to turn from it, and if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Ezekiel chapter 3, 33, verse 8 and 9. He goes on to say, I felt that if the wicked could be effectually won, multitudes of them would repent. And that if they were not won, that blood might be required of my hands. It's a powerful belief. It's a powerful recognition of the responsibility he felt he had on his shoulder to share the truth. The internal struggle was so intense. And his burden to share the prophecy was so great that finally in August 1831, Mr. Miller promised God that if he received an invitation to share this dramatic conclusion from the prophecy, he would accept it. Within minutes there was a knock on his door, which brought the invitation. Miller stumbled, stumbled into a nearby maple grove to pray. And the man that emerged from that particular prayer was led the greatest spiritual revival in American history with tens of thousands of people eagerly waiting for the coming of Jesus on October 22nd, 1844. But they were wrong. Could it be we the spiritual children, we have been called to embrace the same fervency, the same mission, the same passion for the same Christ. Could it be that their disappointment is our appointment to finish the work that they began? The story is told of a judge who uncovered the last painting in an art contest. Now this was a competition that was taking place. The various artists participating in this particular competition. And when the judge uncovered various uh, paintings, everybody was awestruck. The painters were amazing. Some of the paintings were just unbelievably good. And the finishing was great. The title of the painting was Fearless and Peaceful, pretty much opposite holes. But that was what the uh, competition was, and the art was to prove that point. While some of the most deserving works were being shown, people were thinking, could there be a painting better than this one? And there came a next painting, and they said, could there be one better than this one? And the painting were amazing. At last, the last painting was lifted. 
And the painting was of a tumultuous waterfall cascading down a rocky precipice. The crowd could almost feel the cold penetrating spray. So real was the painting. Stormy grey clouds threatened to explode within the lightning, wind and rain. And in the midst of the thundering noises that was drawn in the painting, there was a spindly tree clung to the rocks on the edge of the waterfall. One of its branches reached out in front of the torrential waters as if foolishly seeking to experience the full force and the power of the waterfall, the thin branch. And to the amazement of all the viewers, the painting was of a little bird that had built a nest on the elbow of the branch. <coughs> Content and undisturbed in hers, in the stormy surrounding around, this little bird manifested fearlessness and peace that transcends all earthly turmoil that human beings can understand. This little bird seated there was covering her eggs with the wings. Not worried about the hostile surrounding it was in. The lesson there was fearlessness in the midst of storm. Disciples panicked when the sheep, when the boat was sinking. While the boat was not even yet sunk, their faith had already sunk. Though they were in arm's distance from the very company of the Prince of Peace. Yes, my friends, we are living in turbulent time. Rapid change is taking place around us, both in the Christian and the non-Christian world. And the signs of the times around us are a fulfillment of the prophecy and is giving us a clear indication that the Lord's return is at the door. Are you, or should I say, are we oblivious to this fact? Have we heard it past so many times, this present too, that it has become something you are immune to? Or are we panicking with the things happening around us? Is there some sort of fear? Some sort of panic in our hearts? With what's happening around us? Panicking like the disciples in the boat? If that's the case, I suggest that we do a self introspection of our own selves. Because the clear warnings are given in the scriptures of things that is to happen. Psalms chapter 56 verse 3 says, What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. And Psalm 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law. I want to present to the church a fearless evangelist who like the little bird, though in the midst of hostile surroundings, knew his purpose and fulfilled his calling. One who had a strong burden for dying souls. One who was appointed to warn the world of the coming Messiah and the judgment. A forerunner for the Messiah. He was handpicked by God on this appointment even before he was born. What an awesome responsibility. And he did take it very seriously. He went unto death. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 1, verses 2 to 6, which is the scripture reading for today. Mark chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow it on the screen. It goes on to say, as it is written in the, pro in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before you, before your face, who will prepare your way. 
to wait before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the word, way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 4. John came baptizing in wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went up to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Verse 6 goes on to say, Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a leather belt around his waist, he ate locusts and wild honey. So when you look at the description given of John the Baptist, you will agree with me that he was not an average person. The very description of him portrays him to be a person who protested against the status quo of the society at that time. He was avoiding the luxury of the city for the brutal desert which was near the Dead Sea. He had given up fine clothes and ate the diet of locusts and honey. We are not quite sure what this locust meant in the Greek word. But the two possible meanings of the locust could be either a grasshopper like insect which in Leviticus chapter 11 verse 22 to 20 and 23 is declared it to be clean for food. Or it could have been one of those beans which the very poor people in those times ate. But really doesn't matter what it was. John the Baptist was a counter-cultural revolutionary. In spite of his oddness, or perhaps due to it, he drew large amounts of crowds who came to hear his messages of repentance, confession, and the arrival of the kingdom, and to prepare and get baptized. Mark tells us that all the land of Judea, those from Jerusalem, went out to him. Now, when you say all, it does not mean every single person in the town, but definitely the impact was so great that the Jewish leadership got thinking at that time with the presence of this one lonely man in the desert. The first century of Jewish historian tells us that John's influence was felt even by the king Herod, who feared lest his great influence that John had over the people might put him in a position of power and an inclination on him to raise a rebellion. But King Herod did not know that the prophet was not after his throne. He was after the souls of people. He was after probably the soul of the king himself. No one could see or hear John the Baptist's view as anything but countercultural. He not only looked the part, but he had the countercultural message to support his look. One just that is needed in the 21st century today. This uncouth, non-canonical prophet, John the Baptist, a revolutionary, who didn't even honor the dress code of ministers or preachers, who apparently didn't understand the rules and religious etiquettes, had created a huge impression there. After all, he went so far as to thunder that even the Jewish leadership should change their ways and ask for repentance. And that God didn't need them if they didn't do that. He could make such bold claims on the Jewish. He said God could make rocks to come and raise him. Probably the Jewish could also signify repentance. Blaise Pascal. A French mathematician and a Christian philosopher wrote about the herd mentality that people have to follow a leadership. Blindly following a leadership without thinking where they're going. And this is what he says. When everyone is moving towards depravity, no one seems to be moving. But if someone stops, he slows up the others who are rushing on by acting as a fixed point. You know, I'm not sure, I was, I've been in Bombay in those local trains, you know, and 
the moment you stop, you know, people start pushing and there's all kind of hustle goes on. You are meant to keep moving, but don't be in the front, be standing away. Or you'll be in the train if you don't want to be. <laughs> and probably out of the train if you're near the door, if you don't want to be. Okay, so this is what Blaise Pascal is saying. You have to be the fixed point. The nature of the crowd is such that everybody is sweeping in the same direction and you can hardly tell you are moving. But let one person suddenly stop and in an instant the crowd knows very well the direction they are headed. John the Baptist was raised up before the Messiah's coming to be that fixed point, to refuse the flow of the crowd, but rather to call them to stop, think, Get ready. Before the Messiah comes the second time, and as I said, he is at the door, there will be a generation of his friends who, just like John, will refuse to flow mindlessly, who, just like John, will thus become God's new fixed point for the world to see. Mark chapter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, Behold, I send my messenger, messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying from the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make its path straight. Make its path straight. <laughs> Henry David told me, Lord, if a man does not keep pace with, the, with his companions, perhaps it is because he is hearing a different drummer. Let him step up the music. He hears and how he measures it, which is far away. It is thus as far away music that John the Baptist was hearing to a measured strain that was radically counterculture. It did not blend with the culture of that time. Just like Elijah, who thundered from Mount Carmel, how long will you falter between two opinions? If Lord is God, follow him, or if Paul, follow him. It's so on in 1 Kings 18 21. Choose your God. Because Jesus says it's impossible to serve two. You either love and hate the other, or you hate one and love the other. You have to make a choice. Matthew 6, 24. Which is why Revelation 18, 4 makes the counterculture of being. Babylon is fallen and come out of her. But you may protest that I am not in the doomed kingdom or the fallen culture. Perhaps not. But could the doomed kingdom and the fallen culture of Babylon be in you? There's a wonderful article that came. And, and there was a newspaper cartoon in this particular article. And the newspaper article and the cartoon drawn showed two parents standing in the driveway. The mother is patting the shell-shocked father on his back. The father is struck and shocked with what has happened. As the son, the junior, walks away, from the dump that he has just tossed out the 28 inch high definition color TV. Mother consoles the father. She says, well, you didn't tell him to take out the trash. <laughs> has television, iPhones, iPads, Video games, Xbox, Xbox, Nintendo's, game consoles, movies, Hollywood and Bollywood, internet, video games, Facebook. Have they made that insidious inroads into the hearts and homes <coughs> of the chosen? Research shows, and this research was done by BBC, it shows that an average 14 year old child a 14 year old teenager 
spends about eight hours a day on the internet. When I heard that, I was shocked. And I heard that just this week. It was not part of the main body of a message, but I made a point. Don't get me wrong. I do not condemn any of these electronics. I have some of them, and I use some of them. They can make positive impression on you, and they can be used for positive purposes. And in the 21st century, it is an advantage to have these electronics, provided the way you use it. Some of these electronics are used to praise God in edification of God's word. Right there you see the PowerPoints and the PA system. These are electronics of today's world, edifying God. But are we spending more time than we should on some of these mediums? Are we using it or abusing it? Are we seeking only amusement from it? Are these electronics replacing your time with God, with your family, your ministry, or your prayer life? Neil Postman, a very famous American author, a media theorist, cultural critic, a social commentator, he's got all these titles. He wrote, Television and many other electronics of the 21st century are amusing us to death. A very strong statement. His premise is that it has essentially dumbed down every major activity into entertainment. All that we look is for entertainment, something that will entertain. If it doesn't, it's not worth it. And thus corrupted our society to its core. The news, politics, sports, even church, religion, have they become a place of entertainment? Because probably the crowds love it, the culture calls for it, and we want to stand up to it. And we want to fit into the culture, so we probably may be just following it. Like you heard. Are we marinated in the Babylonian culture so much that some of these things we do quite spontaneously? Not even realizing that we are being deceived very gently and very subtly. I use the word marinated because it really means to be soaked in a liquid for so long to eventually every pore in that particular body is full with the brine of that liquid. Many of us coming from India, we know pickles. Okay? They are marinated in those spices. Are we marinated in the Babylonian culture? Is the analysis of Neil Postman, are the chosen amusing themselves to death? Like most of the world living, wherever they can live and the way they can live, we know that we are living on the eve of Christ's return. We are just on the edge. We are not far. We are on the threshold. How much of what we watch is holy and holy belongs to Jesus. What I'm going to say next may probably stir up a few hornets' nests. But I'm going to say this. Because history has proven that truth is not easy to accept and to act upon. As we are serious about Jesus' commission and his eminent return, we have to embrace the truth, however cruel it may sound, however unkind it may sound. Because we all know God's word is a two-edged sword. It can cut deep and cuts can be painful. And this is what it is. It is estimated that between one to two or five televisions are in an Adventist form. Not a Christian in an Adventist home. Every household. Now we now I do know that not all televisions, like I said before, are used for indulgence. But some of them are used as pure entertainment machines. Then shall we make a bonfire of 
all entertainment machines and call it a day. For some, that will be the only successful remedy of withdrawing yourself from the marinating culture of the Babylonian world. Matthew 5 29 says, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Jesus could be embarrassingly radical at times. It's a statement full of affirmity and power. Because Jesus believed it's better to be saved minus the television or the electronics or then to be lost with it. I know of friends who have made this counter, counter cultural decision and much to their joy they have discovered that since the time they have been away from these electronics, they have found a lot of time to do things like reading, family time, worship and some meaningful activities with the whole family. I hope you have children are listening. You can follow the uh, pictures as well on the screen. I've tried to get some good pictures so that you can also be with me. I was, I was fortunate to attend uh, Evangelist Duane Lemon's uh, messages in Central Church uh, last week. I just managed to go there on Sunday and on Monday. I wish I could go other days as well. A very powerful preacher preaching the present truth. While I was there in one of the messages, he said this, and I have put it down here. Better is the enemy of best. Better is the enemy of best. When we compare our children to the worst out there, we think, oh, our children are better. They are better than so many people, so many children out there. So we don't, or sometimes we hold ourselves from encouraging them to step up from the better position. Or we don't realize that probably that better position is not actually where the child should be. God has called us for a high calling. Not to be better, to be best. Psalms 127 verse 3 and 4 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Very powerful phrase for parents and admonishing for us of, the, of how Jesus, of how God looks at children. And as we all know, we are in a warfare. Whether you like it or not, we are in a war. We are in a great controversy. We are fighting against the powers of darkness every day and every moment. And when you go in a warfare, there are two types of weapons. One is an offensive weapon and one is a defensive weapon. When you talk about offensive weapons, we know there are helmets, there are shields, there may be some other guards. Those are the uh, def uh, uh, defensive weapons. What are the offensive weapons? Arrow. Arrow is an offensive weapon. It's to attack. God-fearing and godly children and young people are like attack weapons in the Lord's hand against the forces of darkness. So Satan, the master of warfare, he knows exactly how he can win the battle, how he can win the war, by destroying the arrows. With all the distractions, of course destructions, through electronics, media, TV, video games and all that, is keeping the generation of the church, which is going to step up the church to the next level, away from the church, away from Bible study, away from worship, away from good health principles of exercise, health, of diet, it's causing a crippling effect on the church because the attack is right at the root, which is the family, which is the home. Satan is a master of inward attack. He knows how he can get to the root and the church keep in number. It's a responsibility on the parent's shoulder to prepare your children as arrows in the Lord's hand. You want to know what John the Baptist's approach was?
us to the Babylonian culture. Let's see what Desire of Ages, page 101 and 102 says. To him, solitude of the desert was a welcome escape from the society in which suspicion, unbelief, and impurity had become well nigh or prevailing. That's what is in the third meaning. He distrusted his, wisdom, his own power to withstand temptation and shrank from constant contact with sin, lest he should lose sense of its exceeding sinfulness. In solitude by meditation and prayer, he sought to gird up the soul of the life work before him. Although in the wilderness he was not exempt from temptation, so far he closed every avenue by which Satan could enter. Yet he was still assailed by the tempter. But his spiritual perception were clear. He had developed strength and decision of character and through the aid of the Holy Spirit he was able to detect Satan's approaches and resist his power. Behold the Lamb of God is how the marinating brine is cleansed from his soul. Then when you sit down to watch a television or you watch something on the computer you need to make this prayer. Jesus, please watch this with me. If you can pray this prayer, then you can watch it. Author Henry Garpy, in his book, Hundred Portraits of Christ, tells of Theodore Roosevelt, a former president of the United States, returning from Africa after a grand hunting safari. As he boarded the ocean liner at the African port, crowds cheered him as he walked on the red carpet. He was fettered with the finest suite on board. Stewards waited on him, hand and foot, during the transoceanic journey home. The former president was the center of the ship's attention. Everybody paid attention to him. Also on board that vessel, there was another passenger. This was an elderly missionary who had given his life for God in Africa. His wife was dead while he was serving in Africa. His children left him. He was returning to his homeland alone. Not a soul on the ship noticed him. Upon the ocean liner's arrival in San Francisco, the president was given a hero's welcome. It descended on the gangplank in beaming glory. But nobody came to welcome the returning missionary. Alone, the elderly man found a small hotel for the night. And as he knelt beside his bed, his heart broke. Lord, he says, I'm not complaining. But I don't understand this. I gave you my life in Africa, in your missionary service. But it seems that no one cares. I don't have one person who could come and meet me and say hello to me. And then in the darkness, it was as if God reached out from heaven and placed his hand upon his shoulder and whispered, Missionary, you are not in home. Yes, my friends, delayed gratification is the true quality of God's people. Where you persevere through the toils of this world as you minister day by day in the Lord's vineyard. It is what the chosen are called to do to live throughout the millennia in fervent submission to the Lord and doing His work. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 says, Speaking of the God's servants, these all died in faith, not having received this promise, but having seen them afar off. <coughs> who are these people who died in faith? Are the prophets of old who died on this side of heaven? Their long winding road of pilgrimage never reached heaven. They saw it afar off, but died on this side of the promised land. And so it may be with you and me probably, if Jesus doesn't return before we die. But the final reward is the delayed gratification which you hold in your heart. 
to persevere through this world, doing his work. And holding your hope deferred until Christ return and being the prisoners of hope that we are. <coughs> Prophet Ellen G. White says in Desire Pages, page 436, Before, honor is, honor is humility. To fill a high place before men, heaven chooses the worker who, like John the Baptist, takes a lowly place before God. The most childlike disciple is the most efficient in labor of, for God. The heavenly intelligence can cooperate with him who is seeking not to exalt himself but to save souls. He who feels most deeply his need of divine aid will plead for it and the Holy Spirit will give unto him glimpses of Jesus that will strengthen and uplift the soul. From communion with Christ he will go forth to work for those who are who are perishing in their sins. He is anointed for his mission and he, and he succeeds where many of the learned and intellectual wisers would fail. But when men exalt themselves feeling that they are necessarily, that they are necessity for success in God's plan, the Lord causes them to set aside the somber reality to us, truth to us. It is made evident that the Lord is not dependent upon them. The work does not stop because of their removal from it, but goes forward with greater power. The moment self-exaltation comes into play, you are set aside. Probably you are put on the bench. You are not in the game. Until you get yourself right, sorted with the Lord, you can come back in the game. But the interesting thing is, however you might find someone Committed to the Lord, if he is set aside, the work which he has left will in fact move forward quicker. Because probably that person was the hindering block. A powerful message. I remember some time back, I mean, few, a good few years back, when uh, my family we moved, we moved from India to UK and we were excited and uh, we wanted to go around seeing places. And uh, we moved, uh, we bought a car. And that was my first car in my life. And uh, we started, to, let's go see some places. And we thought, okay, let's go to Wales. I think it's Wales. Uh, and while we decided to go on this journey, embark on this journey to Wales, I was, uh, well, that time we didn't have navigators, so we used to follow the map, uh, the atlas, the road map uh, and paper, or follow the sign posting on the motorways. And uh, I was very sure where I was heading. And I kept heading, looking at the sign post, and we kept going. Until I came to a point where I found that a lot of names that are going by, of the places is something I never saw in the atlas. So doubt came into my mind and said, maybe I need to check. Though many times, though many times the thought came to my mind, I should go check, but I didn't do it. But I bought my something let me check. I went and checked at the services and I found out that we were heading in the opposite direction. We had taken a wrong turn and we were heading in the opposite direction. I had to stop, turn around, and go back. When I spoke to the, the service station guy, when he told me the reality, a bit embarrassed I was. <coughs> How embarrassing will it be when we journey in our Christian life all through and realize that we are heading in the wrong direction? John the Baptist, like the fixed point, makes a call to repent. Turn your life around. You're headed in the wrong direction. The worst thing is as a Christian for us to realize that all your life you did what you thought was right and actually that was not right, that was wrong. Because you didn't see the reality, the truth. How sorry would that day be of discovery? Christ turns to Laodicea church, the last church on earth, and he pleads, be earnest and repent. Found in Revelation chapter 3 verse 19. So what shall the chosen repent of? Some of us are probably ashamed of the very laundry of dirty clothes we carry. The dirty clothes of sin that we carry in our own hearts. Acts of the Apostles, page 561, goes on to say, The nearer we come to Jesus, the more clearly we discern the purity of his character. And the more clearly shall we see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And the less shall we feel like exalting ourselves. There will be con 
continual reaching out of souls after God, a continual earnest heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the heart before Him. At every advanced step in our Christian experience, our repentance will deepen, provided you come nearer to Christ. Humbling of yourself. You know, one of the significant mark of a person who is submitting himself to Christ is humility. The person has to be humble. If you, if that person is walking close to Christ, there should be no amount of pride. I should be comfortable to approach that person. Do you think people are not comfortable approaching Jesus? Do you think Jesus walking on the streets and people fell off? He might question me or he might corner me or he might throw on me a theory from the a doctrine from the Bible? No. Jesus met people where they are. Walking near with Christ is causes you to humble yourself. Very important characteristic of God's people who are close to Him. We the John the Baptist generation must make ready a people prepared for the Lord. For this purpose we must foremost repent ourselves and make a call of repentance for fellow believers and friends and the loved ones. Loved ones to be within our family. We must then like John the Baptist reach out to the world where souls are dying every day without knowing the truth. There will come a time and a belief that it's not more when you and I stand, it's not more when you're knowing the truth and when you and I are standing before the righteous church and we should know that we are on the right side. Nobody would be standing before the righteous church with his shoulders way high up because he's done something great. Do we cry in our hearts? The song, rest the perishing, care for the dying. Do we cry in our hearts the song, seeking, seeking the lost, pointing them to Jesus? Is this song coming in your hearts? Through the week? Friends, Jesus couldn't be more clear in Luke chapter 2 verse 48. It says, for everyone to whom much is given for him, from him much will be required. And to him, much has been committed of him who will as more. Even as I preach this message, the courts of heaven is in session. What might seem like business as usual for us, week after week, day after day, does not dim or mask the somber reality that we are now living in the most urgent hour of human history. The coming of Christ is very, very close. Great controversy, page 601 says, The destiny of the earth's teeming multitude is about to be decided. And our own future and well-being, and also the salvation of other souls, depends upon the course that we now pursue, that we could be you and me. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord, with fasting and prayer, to meditate much upon the world, especially upon the scenes of judgment. We should not seek to seek a deep we should now seek a deep and living experience in the things of God. We have not a moment to lose. This was what Ellen Joy said in 1800s and 19, many, many years, centuries ago, a century ago. If repentance for the chosen is deeper, as we go through, should we pray daily prayer, search me, O God and see if there is any wicked way in me. Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24. And should we then ask, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins that He reveals in you and me. Friends, the Bible offers choices. All through the scriptures, God, our loving God, believes in choices. And so the Bible offers choices. Allowing sinful man to choose God of his own will. No force. Joshua chapter 24 verse 15. Joshua says, Choose it this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. First Kings 14 21. Elijah says, How long will you fall between two opinions? If Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. 
Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. Moses says, That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Choices, choices, choices. Choices are there for you and me to be. Friends, is a good time for you and me to make the choice like John the Baptist who stand up as a fixed point for Christ. Amen. Lord of God is sent forth to leave us. To thee be glory. Father, you have sent messages throughout history to warn us, to warn your people. The time is at night. John the Baptist, your servant, fulfilled his calling, even unto death. Father, the same responsibility which we are on the shoulders of your people is on our shoulders as well. Maybe not have the bloods of the people who die because we held back ourselves from telling the truth. May we not be found guilty before the righteous judge in the final reckoning we pray. Give us strength. Help us to do your will. Amen. Amen. Amen.